My work ethic kind of put me in a position that, that I could be a quality backup. Stay cool and kept us together. Doug Peterson. Doug, 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 Doug. You know, I had a chance to work, obviously, with Brett Favre, you know, for eight years in Green Bay. And those last couple kind of got my coaching juices flowing a little bit. The career backup took the road less traveled to an NFL job, starting in high school where he coached Calvary Baptist in Shreveport, Louisiana. And kind of the theme all week was finish. Finish the play, finish the quarter, finish the game. And that's what they did. They came out and, and, and played extremely hard and extremely well in this ball game. His former coach Andy Reid offered him an NFL position with the Eagles in 2009. Peterson followed Reid to Kansas City in 2013. And just three years later, he landed himself a head coaching job. This organization hasn't won in quite some time. It's my job to turn that around. And you do it one day at a time. You do it one player at a time, you do it one coach at a time. With a lengthy rebuild seemingly ahead, Peterson was viewed by many as nothing more than a temporary placeholder. There's always doubt, there's always skepticism. I knew there were gonna be articles written. Nobody knew who I was. I had no previous coaching experience. I was just a coordinator, a position coach. He's been with Andy Reid for so long, and, and you know, Andy you know, basically said, you know, here's Philadelphia, go, go hire Doug Peterson. You know, Andy was one val valuable voice amongst many. It reminded me of what they said when we, when we hired Andy Reid. The worst coaching hire, he never really called the plays. Um, what were they thinking? Everybody basically, you know, said that I was gonna be a one and done. That underdog thing that came along with that team, it started with our coach. We're gonna to come to work every day. As coaches, it's our job to make you better. The first thing he did was tell me about the coaches on your staff. And he didn't care where they came from. He didn't say, I need my guys in these positions. He said, if you guys feel that strongly about these guys, I, I wanna keep them. Peterson kept six assistant coaches from the staff of the departed Chip Kelly. You know, I felt like I, I had hired a, a really good staff. You know, I wanted, uh, obviously on the defensive side, somebody like Jim Schwartz, who had former head coaching in his background. And so it kind of gave me a level of comfort. I knew the defense was gonna be taken care of with a guy like Jim. You know, the other thing too was, was making sure that, that the quarterback position was right. I mean, that was kind of the first task when, when I hired you know, Dee Filippo and Frank Reich as my offensive coordinator. You know, three guys that have been around quarterbacks. We had to make sure that our quarterback position was, was right. One of the coolest things about going there was having a chance to, to draft a, a quarterback, to go in saying, hey, we're looking for the quarterback of the future of this franchise. We just traveled the country working out these top quarterbacks to try to find the guy that would fit the Philadelphia Eagles. What's the first thing that's going through your mind? Well, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm seeing the boundary safety. During those travels, it was really evident that Carson Wentz was the guy. Once we identified the franchise quarterback that we were interested in, how do you go from 13 to get up there? Uh, it took a two-step process, brilliant. GM Howie Roseman pulled off two trades to get the number two pick, and the Eagles had their future in place. With the second pick in the 2016 NFL Draft, the Philadelphia Eagles select Carson Wentz, quarterback, North Dakota State. Congratulations. Appreciate it. Hey, I'm excited. You know, all I was thinking about today was uh, when you were here, in, when you were here in the building, and the way we finished our meeting, and and we were like, man, we, we we'd love to have you in this room, and you looked at us and said, hey, make it happen. Carson Wentz showed promise in his first year. But the head coach was criticized often and had fans openly wondering if he would be the guy to lead this team to a Super Bowl. They kept it conservative, and Ryan Matthews lost it. You know what? The Eagles coach is a moron. He's a moron. I don't want to hear about how great Doug Peterson is a coach. He stinks. You learn from your rookie season. There were some bumps that first year. That's the last thing they wanted that happen. That turns what would have been a 40-some-odd-yard field goal into something a little bit more difficult. 
Doug Peterson, you ruined this game. You blew it. Uh, it's quite obvious. I'm a little surprised by this decision by Doug Peterson that you know, on the road you get a chance to make it a one possession game with a field goal. Let's settle for the three points. Here's Wentz. There's nothing out there, and Wentz is swallowed up. That play did not have a chance right from the start. I mean, they were tough on him. He never bat an eye, he never sweat. He just kept moving. Getting a Chip Kelly feeling about Doug Peterson. I mean, I knew in my heart, I, was, I, I knew the type of play caller I, I wanted to be and I was going to be. And I learned from the first year from the standpoint of, look, if I'm going to make a decision for the team in game, I better spend time in the off season and in training camp going through that situation with the guys so that when we're, you know, in a game and it comes up, we've been there before. Doug Peterson needs to fix his act, man. He needs to fix his act right quick, or he's going to be right gone, and we're just going to become the Browns of the league. In a 2017 Week 2 loss to his mentor, Peterson called 56 pass plays to just 13 run plays. I think the running game has to be more productive to make life easier for Wentz. You have to have the threat of being able to gash that other team. Completely agree. That's not a balance uh, for success. It starts with me as a play caller. By no means do I want to throw the ball that many times, but, but we got to get the run game fixed. You know, for me, the decision to continue to throw was, looking back on it now, was, was obviously not the right decision. We're all going to make mistakes in this business, but you have to learn from them. Eliminate the mistakes. All three phases. And you come out on top of these games. And it's a little different feeling in here, in the dressing room. Following the game, Peterson was approached by his own players' counsel, who requested he adjust his play calling. Their plea did not fall on deaf ears. He established a leadership council uh, right away in his tenure. So when players come to him with suggestions, um, he's open to them. It was great to get the feedback from the guys. It was positive. It was constructive. It was pretty cool to see, you know, Doug really embrace kind of the players' feedback and and really put it, you know, put it to use and, and really took it to heart. What does that say about the head coach? I think when you're a coach, you know, you have this mindset that we're going to do it my way. Everything's going to be my, you know, I don't, that's not going on here. Everybody needs to talk and make sure that you yes. know what's going on. Right, right. And that's something that we've struggled with before. Yeah. It's not my way or the highway philosophy. It's a collaborative effort. It always has been, always will be. We just got to get it fixed. Um, no way fans or butts. We got to go to work. So we're we got we to gotta run the ball. What's that? We got to run the ball. Yeah. The following week. The Eagles ran the ball a season high 39 times for 193 yards. What did you do? It goes to Clement. Clement outside. He's at the 10. He's at the 5. He's in the end zone. Corey Clement. But it was a last second pass play that may have saved the season. 24 apiece, seven seconds left. Ball at the 38. What did you do? Wentz takes the snap. He's looking, he's looking, fires on the far side, and it's caught, stepping out of bounds, with one second as Alshon Jeffrey. Field goal. Coach puts a very high emphasis on what we call our mock game, and we always practice, you know, two or three of those situations each week, whether it be a Hail Mary pass into the end zone, whether it be the Olay call, like that was. As a coach, it was really neat because we harp on this kind of stuff all the time. I feel like we wear it out. We. You rep it over and over again. And these are the kind of plays that you might only run three, four times a year. We still got a timeout. We're going to same thing, gun tray left, bunch. Coach Reich had made a coaching point on that play uh, the week before that he wanted Nelson to get more vertical on his route. If he would have gone right to the flat, I'm not sure the corner would have bit up like he did, which would have allowed us to make that throw to Alshon. That's really was indicative of the whole year. There was a there was a trust factor, there was a attention to detail, and then there was a consistency in the approach of preparation that that led to that kind of a moment. He can hit this. This is a 61-yard field goal attempt. Ball is spotted. The kick is away, 
And the kick is... It's good! When I came off his foot, I felt real good about it. And then I would say the hard thing about being a coach is as soon as it goes through the uprights, you're already worried about the next week, you know? So it's like, gosh, I mean, that's the coach's life. There's a lot of twists and turns in this season. What a game! Who knows if we miss that and they beat us in overtime, does it ding our confidence? Are we still a good football team? Great job, bro. Great job. Last year, we were so fortunate in these types of games, right? I do think it was a turning point. That gives you a little glimpse of where we can go. It just created some momentum for us, I believe, that, that we just carried all the way through. So I was starting to feel it, and then lost the franchise quarterback. Wentz on first down. Looks. He's going to run. Penalty flag thrown as Wentz goes into the end zone. Howie sort of tapped me on the shoulder and whispered to me because didn't want anyone else in the box to hear. And he goes, it's a knee. And I'm thinking, oh my God, it's a knee? And he, and he said, yeah, they think it's an ACL. And um, it was like heartbreaking. Eagles are reporting it is a left knee injury. He is done for today. We do not know the severity of the knee injury, but I can tell you as I was standing back by that Eagles locker room, all the support staff that was back there with Carson Wentz all walked out just shaking their heads. I was like, oh my gosh, the MVP of the National Football League just went down. You know, this team's been resilient all, all season long. We clinched the NFC East that, that night. It was a somber locker room. It was a little bit of a somber plane ride home. Inside, in my gut, I was crushed. You know, there were a few tears shed when I got off, when we got off the plane in my house. For this to happen to our team and to him, there was a moment there where it was really, really hard. I'll never forget sitting in my office on Monday and I got a text message from my son and it's a picture that I actually have in my basement. Uh, from a concert I went to as a player in Green Bay. And it said, um, one man can make a difference, but a team can make a miracle. And I totally forgot about it. And it just, it hit me, you know, like a ton of bricks. Like, man, that's it. That's totally it. Bring a little juice today. Bring a little energy today. I walked in. Man, I was energetic. You know, I'm sure people were looking at me like, this guy's crazy. Because we're sitting here 11 and 2. Can I tell you this? If you, you after we win this game Sunday... After we win this game, you got a first round bye. Then I shared the quote, the picture. And I says, my son sent me this picture. And I says, one man can make a difference. Carson Wentz can make a difference. Jason Peters can make a difference. Darren Sproles, I went through the whole list. Yeah, these guys can make a difference, but it's this team in this room that's gonna make a miracle the rest of the season. But heading into week 15 with a backup quarterback, most were thinking there would be no fairy tale ending. It was like the collective football world had completely written off the Philadelphia Eagles. I mean, I'm sure there were one or two people maybe who believed, but I, I'm not sure about that. I think it, I think it was 100% the Eagles are finished. The last quarterback to start in the postseason for the Eagles was Nick Foles in 2013. Prior to the 2017 season, the Eagles decided to bring him back to Philadelphia. When we had the discussion, and Coach Peterson and, and Jeffrey, and we had to make this call, I remember just the three of us talking about, you know, it's a playoff game. Do we have confidence Nick Foles can come in and win? And this is literally the conversation. And we all turned to each other and said, no doubt. The Eagles' first playoff game was still weeks away. But it didn't take long for Foles to prove it was the right decision. Nick is like a maniac as far as wanting to throw the ball down the field. So I think from a play caller standpoint, you know, Doug did a great job of giving Nick a lot of opportunities to throw the ball down the field. Firing, wide open, touchdown! Bulls fires, and it is caught! Aguilar, touchdown! And the Eagles are now 12 and two, they are one win away from a bye throughout the playoffs. A late come from behind win against the Raiders on Christmas clinched home field. 
But the Eagles did not look like a team primed for a Super Bowl run. Against the Raiders on Monday night was was not not pretty football. That's when uh, you know we really started as a coaching staff, you know, to really hone in on what we felt Nick did well. I went back and and studied some of his tape when he was with the Rams. I studied some of the tape when he was with the Eagles, you know, under Chip Kelly. He didn't have a ton of football, you know, last year, and so that was his that was his preparation in in, in getting ready to the you know to play in the postseason, and and so it took took a little time. You know, for us to get that together. Quarterback Nick Foles and the rest of the Eagles did not inspire confidence on a national level. Um, if Carson were playing, I think we probably would have been the favorites in every game, clearly. So just because it wasn't Carson and it was Nick, I get it. Nobody's giving you a chance. Nobody's giving us a chance. It should piss you off. We're in our home stadium. We're the number one seat, and no one has given us a chance. It pisses me off. Hey, this thing about respect, man. They said the Falcons the only team in history with a second round block? What the yeah. f in our house? Here we go. A funny thing happened with the matchup between two of the NFC's top four offenses. A defensive battle broke out. Love the way this defense is flying around, getting after the football. <laughs> Atlanta started with the ball on their own 24-yard line. 13 plays later, it was at the Eagles, two, And it was fourth down. Hey, this is the season. This is it right here. Let's go. This is the season right here. You knew where the ball was going, and it was a play that we'd talked about over and over in practice. All right, this is fourth down. All right, here we go. They were like, we got this. Don't worry about it. It's fourth and two. We got this thing won. My mindset at that time on the sideline, that was cool jazz. It was right, right here. Biggest play in ages. This isn't the play of the game, folks. This is the play of the season. I knew someone was going to make a play. Ryan rolls. Ryan pumps. Ryan is throwing it up in the air. Incomplete! It went from smooth jazz right there to, obviously, Iron Maiden there in three seconds when that ball hit the ground. <laughs> Minnesota was the top-ranked defense in the NFL. Going in that game, they were setting records in terms of third-down production on defense, and um, you know, we did our homework and you know put another good plan together. The coaching staff harkened back to the 2013 season, when Nick Foles threw 27 touchdowns with just two interceptions and looked comfortable in an offense that utilized run-pass option plays. We had busted out some new RPOs to uh, take advantage of Harrison Smith. He likes to give you false looks. He'll like to start down on the line of scrimmage. He likes to go back to the middle field late. He tries to play with the cadence with the quarterback. So we did add some a few plays up for Harrison that we knew we would have a chance to possibly take advantage of him being out of position. I really think at that point in the time, our sideline, our players had a feeling that hey, we're going to go to the Super Bowl. From that point, the Eagles' offense played with confidence. Any concerns about Foles were proven unfounded. Foles steps up. He is looking. He is going deep and alone. And in for the touchdown is Jeffrey. And Nick Foles had him for a 53-yard touchdown. The use of run-pass options in an attempt to throw off all pro safety Harrison Smith was working. This run-pass option has been the best thing for him. It's settled him down. It's allowing him to get the reads that he wants. Peterson's play calls kept Smith a step behind and gave Foles the step he needed on the second half's most pivotal play. As a play caller, do you have a favorite play from that game? Minnesota? Oh, the flea flicker. No! They come right back. It's a flea flicker. And I don't know, it was just kind of the right time. You know, I mean, you just have a feel for that. You know, as a former quarterback, as a play caller, you just get a sense. And it is good! Touchdown! Tolly Smith! 
And it's one of those plays where you put it in, you work it. It might be in week one of the regular season, and you kind of work it and work it, but you never get a chance to call it. There's a lot of plays on the sheet, and uh, you know it's got to hit your brain to call it. All I did was watch him to make sure he's locked. <laughs> Coach makes a great call to call it there. That goes back to Coach's aggressiveness in his play calling. He's not afraid to, to dial up a flea flicker when we need to play in, in the NFC Championship against the number one defense in the National Football League. And what was just a two-year turnaround, the Philadelphia Eagles were Super Bowl bound. The story of the biggest comeback in Super Bowl history was a cautionary tale. My message to the team was about finish. The whole theme of the season was ownership. And so if we're ever in that moment, let's own the moment and let's finish the game. That's why you're here, man. Yep. Right? Lead them. We're all here for Be great. Me. Let's get it. That's it, baby. The only bit of advice was um, do what you've done all year. Let it all out. Kick their ass. We're taking it. We're taking it. Go. We're taking it. Let's do it. I knew going into the game that I was going to stay aggressive. And I just knew that given the opportunity in the game, I was going to have to stick to what got us to that game. Philadelphia had 10 plays of 15 or more yards in the first half and a 15 to 12 lead late in the second quarter. It was fourth and goal at the one. We're going for it right here. We're going for it right here. Field goal never crossed my mind. Here we go, here we go. We were going to run the ball. Three left open cluster. Lexus Speedo kill Ford Wizard on one. I remember breaking the huddle. We were a little hesitant getting to the line. We got to go, guys. My eyes were on the play clock, and it was winding down, so I ran down the sideline and burned the timeout. Here we go, timeout. Timeout, timeout. timeout gets called, and, you know, Nick comes over, and he suggests it. You want Philly Philly? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Here we go. I just looked up and I was like, yeah. Because we, you know, it's one of those moments where you're like, this is the play that's going to win you the Super Bowl. In this bitch. And I was like, here we go. Here we go. Here's Philly. Philly special. Philly special. Ready? Folds in the gun. Here we go, here we go. Lemon now lines up behind full. Easy, easy. Kill, kill. Lane, lane. Goes directly to Clement. Reverses it. The pass goes into the end zone. And it is a touchdown by Big Foles. They brought it out in the Super Bowl. There's a lot of moving parts to that play. Kill, kill. Lane, lane. That's what was really cool. The surprising element is Nick Foles being on the end of the pass. Is his position coach, you're like, oh, please don't drop it, please don't drop it. Let's go! Let's go! I'm doing it, I'm doing it right there. I know, I know. Great call. Awesome. Good call, dude. As much as it looked like it, Philly Special was not some play drawn up in the sand. We had lists of trick plays. And so we had the Philly Special that Chicago had run the year before against Minnesota on tape. Here is an end around throw. Meredith throws right side. Barkley's in. Touchdown. The only player on the field for both plays is number 17, Alshon Jeffrey. Uh, Alshon does exactly what he's supposed to do, diving inside and getting the corner cleared out of there. Corey Clement makes a you know perfect dead pitch to Trey as he comes around. He barely has to adjust his grip on the football, and then, you know, three steps out of the, the exchange there, he can find Nick wide open. Just tremendous uh, execution by the guys. It wouldn't be the last fourth down conversion of the game. Let's go for it right here. Go for it right here. It's a season. In my mind, it was a season. As you would expect, Doug Peterson with a gamble here. Nobody blinked. Everybody expected to go for it on fourth down in that situation. Fourth of one. Falls back. Falls. Fires. Falls completes it. When he caught it, for 
from where I was standing on the sideline, my thought was, I hope he got it. They knocked him back, but his forward progress gave him the first down. He made a play, you know, and, and Zach consistently did that for us in crucial moments throughout the year. He, he was making plays when we needed him. What's your thought process right now? All right, we're going to run the we're just gonna score a touchdown. We're gonna score yeah. a touchdown. Hey, let's put this thing in the end zone. All right, put it in the end zone. Execute. At the most crucial moment in the game, the Eagles once again turned to Ertz. Slant, touchdown, Zach Ertz! That was on our third down game plan, but not necessarily right there on, and on that spot on the field, but the perfect time for Coach to call that play. Against Atlanta, the Eagles ran a similar third down play. Holes, fires, complete. He's got a first down as he guns at the Ertz. Zach Ertz was once again split wide. When slot receiver Nelson Aguilar went in motion, it created an isolation for Ertz. The play converted the third down, but the stop was made by the safety. In the Super Bowl, the Eagles made sure there wouldn't be a safety this time. When we spit Corey out of the backfield and they vacated, and it was, it was one-on-one with McCourty, he ran a really good route. I remember thinking to myself, okay, this is for the Super Bowl. It's one of our best against one of their best. The Eagles had the lead, but the biggest play of Super Bowl 52 was yet to come. We're this close, one step away, dog. Everything you got, everything you got. I knew it would come down to at one point where now they've got to really get the ball down the field. I said our fangs would come out at that point. We have to have more physical rushes. We gotta have more power rushes. If you finesse this, we're gonna have an issue now. We had saw on the sideline throughout the game that no matter where Fletcher lined up, that he was gonna get the center sliding and protection to him. So we had kind of talked and said, why don't we play Fletcher on the right side if we get an opportunity? Now what? Let me eat on six nine, his eyes be wide open like. And now we'll create a one-on-one -on -one matchup with their right guard with Brandon. The Eagles are two minutes at 21 seconds away from winning a Super Bowl. Brady back again. He stepped up his head. And he fumbled the football and the Eagles have it. We got, it. we got the ball. We got the ball. We got the ball. They finally hit Tom Brady. We're fortunate we get the slide protection to Fletcher as they've been getting most of the half. It, it left Brandon with a one-on-one. -on -one. And he did the most important thing that we talked about. He found the football. The hit, Brandon Graham. When you needed him, he came through. Peterson and the Eagles would not be able to breathe until the game's final play. Nine seconds left. Go, 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 go. With nine seconds left, if they wanted to, they could still take one more shot at the sideline. Then Gronk ended up flexing out, and they knew that they were going deep. Oh, they're going deep, they're going deep. So Malcolm did a good job, like, hey man, we're going deep, we're gonna have to start covering these guys instead. Brady has to make uh, Brandon Graham miss, makes a, a great play to make Brandon miss, and all of a sudden, again, it was slow motion, that ball's in the air. Brady, he's back again. It seemed like it took about nine seconds just to reach the ground. The thing I remember most was looking around the crowd and, and realizing that I was actually getting the, the confetti on top. And the game is over! The game is over! The Philadelphia Eagles are Super Bowl champions! Let the celebration 